All right, all welcome to Developer Conversations. My name is Allison Daly, and I'm the founder of Recruiting Innovation and your host for the Tech Interview Transformation Series and for all of these wonderful developer conversations that we are going to be having through the Tech Inter Interview Transformation Program. Um, I wanted, with these developer conversations, I wanted to provide an, op uh, an option and a, a resource to our wonderful talent uh, participants to really not only hear directly from different types of developers about their workflows and what makes them tick and how to best recruit them as a specialist, but also to kind of create a, an open, safe space for all of your questions to be fielded and answered. Um, I know that, you know, through my own experience and also through my work with different types of recruiters that one of the hardest things is knowing what questions to ask and not wanting to sound dumb or lose credibility, but we don't get better if we don't get help. And so I wanted this, the full program is here to just connect us with technologists and provide a great place to, to learn more. Um, I couldn't be more thrilled for our first guest. Uh, Kyle Coberly is uh, a little bit of a Denver developer man about town. Um, he and I have known each other for at least five years at this point. He is a senior full stack developer. He is a full stack evangelist. He's also an educator. He's worked at, with a couple of the different um, development boot camps in Denver. Um, he also is the uh, main organizer for a conference called Develop Denver that I've also been on the planning committee for for years. Um, it's kind of like the best developer event every year in Denver. Um, I know I'm a little biased, but we have a great time and it's all about community. Um, and so I am thrilled to have Kyle here. What we're gonna do today is I'm actually gonna let him introduce himself. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna hear from Kyle about uh, an example project that he has been on um, that He'll walk us through those five steps of the software development life cycle that you all have been learning in our uh, tech interview transformation program. And then we are gonna open it up to any of your questions. So look down at the bottom of the, the Zoom uh, menu. There's a chat box. Um, type in your questions. We'll have a, an open 15 minutes at least for all of your questions. You can ask them questions as a hiring manager, as a candidate, as a general technologist. No question is too silly or um, unwanted. So without further ado, Mr. Coberly, tell us all about yourself. Hello. Uh, thanks, Allison. So I'm Kyle. Um, as Allison said, I'm an educator. Uh, so I'm currently a lead instructor at Flatiron School. Uh, before that, I was the faculty director of Galvanize. Uh, I'm also a business dork. I have a master's in engineering management. And uh, as Allison said, I'm Executive Director for Develop Denver, um, and I'm also a software engineer. Uh, I've been Devin now for uh, probably about a dozen years, um, and uh, I'm a full stacker, so I am all over the place. And uh, which suits you, right? Yes, indeed, <laughs> it, it definitely does. Um, and so I, uh, I work on all kinds of different stuff. I work on tiny projects. I work on very large projects. Uh, I've spent probably the last few years mostly in startup life, but I did, I was at Pearson Education for about four years also. And uh, that's me. Awesome. Well, thanks for making the time today. I know that uh, pandemic or not, we all must keep going. So I, I appreciate you making time for us. Mm -hmm. um, with that said, um, you know, one of the things, the key elements of the Tech Interview Transformation Program is introducing uh, the audience to the, the alignment framework and the concept of that five-step software development life cycle sure. from the, to the recruiter's perspective. So mm -hmm. you and I have talked about this before. You have an excellent project example um, yeah. from your kitchen sink web app. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So let me let me just pose this for you the way I'm, I'm we're training folks with the within okay. the process. So Kyle... Will you talk to us about a project that was, you're most proud of? What was the goal of the project and how did you go about solving it? Sure, so um, as an educator, I get asked a lot about, um, hey, how do I, do, how do, I uh, do video in my apps? How do I put maps in my app? Um, how do I do sign in with Google? Or like a, a lot of like um, uh, features in apps that like the documentation for is actually like pretty poor. 
And so, or at least it's, it's too much. Um, and I think what a lot of people need is like, they just need to see a working example. Software developers in general, very good pattern matchers. So if they can see an example, they'll go, oh, cool. So I just changed this to this and this to this, and then it works in my app. And that's true. Uh, and it's so rare that you actually see that in projects. So I made a, a site called Web App Kitchen Sync um, that has like a couple examples of things that I get asked a lot. And um, here, uh, is it okay if I screen share, Allison? Sure, let's do it. Oops, host disabled participant screen share. Oh yeah, safety in the Zoom world. Let me see if That's I can. Sure. Uh, while you're figuring, let me know when you get it. I can. Keep okay. It um, so the uh, so what I wanted was working examples of some of these like cool technology integrations with annotated code. So it's, it's the actual code that's running on the site and you can see it, but it, it's also de uh, describing what it does and how it works and how you can change it and some of those kinds of things. Um, and so I, I, I end up using that a lot in teaching, uh, like how do I put this in my project? Thanks, Allison, I got it. Okay. Beautiful. So this is Web App Kitchen Sink. Uh, how do I handle payments? And oops. You're slowing down, come on, come on. There we go. How do I handle uh, payments with Stripe? Um, and so you can do something like- Okay, right. so this is, this is what you built as Correct. a result of everyone asking you miscellaneous questions. Exactly. Okay. Um, so people wanna know how they can process payments on their site. All right, well, this is cost $10. And if we enter in a fake credit card number here and uh, try to submit payment, payment complete. So this is the actual code that is being used on this site with uh, explanations of what all the different pieces do. Uh, so, so if you wanna put payments on your site, you can use this as an example to start with uh, and adapt it to, to your site. So uh, it, it's, it's some of the, those kinds of things. I've also got that for uploading files, uh, social auth, using cameras. So, uh, oops, that's my laptop camera. There we go. This one. So the goal is that you're making a live workable example exactly. that they would see what it looks like and then see the code that corresponds with the what the user sees correct okay oh it will let me it will let me use the camera because i'm using it right now <laughs> right imagine that uh, yeah and then like i also put some like uh programming patterns that are again like very heady and weird when you uh read them written, but when you see an example, you're like, oh, I do that all the time. That's what that's called. Okay. So you, the goal of the project was to, to build something so you don't have to repeat yourself a lot, but that people right. can see in action. Mm -hmm. um, so when you're starting to build out this project, sort of what was, what was your research phase? How did you decide how you wanted to, to make this come alive? So a lot of the projects that I work on are like solutions to actual problems that I have. So as I was planning this, I was like, all right, what do people ask me all the time? Uh, and like, these were the ones that came up first. And so I was like, all right, well, I'll start there. Okay. So you went, you started with a list of the things that you've been getting. Mm -hmm. um, and then sort of how did you go about knowing what code you wanted to use and sure. how you're going to build it? So then what I did is I go, all right, well, how would I do that? And with some of these, like I'd actually never worked with cameras before. And so like I went through the awful documentation for all of these things and I did the suffering so that somebody else doesn't have to. And I played with all these things and I tried to break it and see what the boundaries of it were and those kinds of things. And then I go, okay, so now that I sort of get how it works, how would I write this code? Uh, and then I wrote that code and I go, all right, now how would, if I were showing this code to somebody else, what would help them understand it? And so then I wrote the annotations uh, for it. Like what would, what would, if I were showing this to a student, what would confuse them? Uh, and anything like that, I would probably uh, make a note for. Okay. And then what is this, uh, the web app kitchen sink built with? Uh, this one I believe is a view app. It's actually been a little bit, let's get on the bottom. 
is right here. So yeah, this is uh, built with, see that's the back end. Uh, yeah, it's a it's a view app on the front end, and then say an express app on the back end. So that's Node.js, um, and that's a PostgreSQL database, and a couple other smaller things. Okay. Now this is a great trend, like you know, segue into the world of full stack developer because as a full stack developer, you're putting it all together rather than Absolutely. just being the front end person sharing with the back end. So. Walk us through a little bit as a full stack developer. I mean, your, your, your research and design process is a little bit more cohesive, almost more upfront than others. What's, yes. what's your approach as you, as, as a full stack developer, do you have like a workflow? Like that you start from the back and move forward? Is it everything at once? Uh, that's a great question. So I, uh, before I was in software, uh, I was actually a marketer. And so like, and like I said, I'm the, business dork. And so I, I try to approach all of this from a product standpoint. So I got kind of one foot in each world. And um, I'll usually start with like features or user stories, or I can show you something I'm working on right now, actually. Uh, and it is, this is for a talk I'm giving on Monday. Uh, I'm trying to like actually demonstrate what one of these workflows could look like. And uh, I asked a bunch of people, I was like, all right, what, what app do you want me to build? And they requested toilet paper inventory management system. Gee, so, that's uh, useful. Yeah. <laughs> right <around> now. <laughs> um, and so I start with something like this, where uh, these are the things that I think this app should do. So given I'm on a main page and I, and I currently have 12 roles and I go through a role every five days, then these things should show up on the page. Or when I add this many roles, then I should see that I have this many remaining. So these are just like, uh, these are like features like a product manager or something would do. But these actually connect directly with uh, these uh, software tests. So normally this would be what a lot of people would do at the end where they like test a project to see if it works. So what I do, I do a thing called test driven development, which is I write what, what that test is first. And once that exists, I know when I'm done. And so there's no testing step at the end. Um, I'm declaring what success looks like up front. And so when all of these things work, then I know that the app works. And so then once I do that, I go, all right, well, um, I start from the part that the user interacts with. What would a, a user think, um, like, what would make a user think that this works? And so as part of making these test pass, I'll write things like, I'll write this markup for the page. And then, um, so like there's variables and stuff in here now, but I'll just hard code all that. If I just showed this to somebody, would it convince them that it's real? Kind of like uh, designers do with mock-ups and that kind of thing. Except, I, hang on, baby. Um, I'm a, except I don't, I don't do mock-ups. I like actually make the product. Uh, I, I don't know how to use Photoshop or any of that kind of stuff, but I do know how to, I, I do have some design skills. And so I actually write the, um, the layout and stuff for this right in here and I hard code all the values. Once I have that, then I make those values dynamic. And so I start working front to the back. Uh, once my user interface works, once the logic of the user interface works, then I just go further back in the stack. And so then I might start building APIs and building a backend for this. And then um, I'll go through a similar process there where I fake everything out on the backend. And once it's working fake, then I make it real and I add a database. And then something that I'll also do fairly early on in this process is um, I'll do the infrastructure. So like DevOpsy kinds of things. Um, I'll, I'll set up a continuous integration server or set up continuous deployment. And so this is, it really is a process that spans all the way from like, all right, what is the app supposed to do to like, what is it supposed to look like to how is it supposed to function, to how does it get deployed and scale and all that kind of stuff. Okay. 
This is a lot. And I will say that um, I love seeing the, the, the code, but it's also a little overwhelming because I don't know anything that I'm looking at. <laughs> Just sure. to be very tan transparent with you, although yeah. I know the story and I know kind of what you're doing. So it sounds like the um, sort of the research and design stage for you as um, a full stack, mm -hmm. you're like thinking all the way through, but it sounds like you start kind of in the front of the stack, the front end, yes. then you're thinking about the database, and then you're also thinking about how it's gonna go live into the world and the internet, all Absolutely. within that research and design phase. Definitely. So I'm, a, um, I, I'm an agile practitioner, and so uh, I don't do all of those as phases, I do them all, all the time. Okay. So part of agile is we're never not designing, we're never not testing, we're never not deploying. Okay. Uh, so we're trying to do all of those things in little bits uh, over and over and over again. Okay. And those like so that, those short iterative cycles. Yes, exactly. Like development swirl. Yes. Swirling. <laughs> okay. So then, okay, now I'm, 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 I'm figuring that out. So it sounds like you sort of frame up the basics. Yes. Make the basics work, have your test set up. At what point, and then, then you go in and like, hard code everything or yes. do the real code? What, what is that like to do fake sure. thin real? What's that? Uh, that? That's a great question. So <laughs> what that would look like uh, is if I pull up some code, and you don't need to know anything about code for this, but if I just make some space around this. So I want to find out how many days of toilet paper I have left. So I've got this variable in here that's keeping track of that. When I'm starting out though, I do something like that. Oh, I just you just put in a number. number rather than days. Right. Okay. I hard coded a number rather than generating it or calculating it or anything like that. But that's enough to get the user interface working. I can see what that looks like on the page. And in this case, it looks like Okay, so oh. there's my five. Okay. Um, but if I want to change that to um, six, seven, whatever. I don't need that to get an idea of what this interface is supposed to be like. So once I have all those pieces hard coded in, then that actually gets calculated with how many rolls and what the rate is and whatever else. So this is sort of your way of doing kind of like wireframes where you're face, exactly. okay, you're shaping everything up, but it's exactly. not the real thing. And right. you know it's not the real, like it's not gonna be the right. final. This is what I'm using instead of Photoshop or like some Adobe product or something, or even I like uh, for this one in particular here, I'm going to take you on a little journey. If you look at my camera, I actually have the steps for this on my table. So, uh, <laughs> oh, so there yeah, you go. I just literally sketch it out on my uh, whiteboard on my table. Hot off the whiteboard. And then I go, okay. So if I was going to implement that, um, if I don't have to account for any of the logic or any of the programming pieces of it, if I just make an interface, what would it look like? And yeah, it serves the exact same purpose as a mock-up. Okay. But once that exists, then there's not a separate step where I build it out. I'm just adding logic to it. But the interface is, has always been the ultimate interface that I'm going to use. And is this a workflow that's typical of most full stack developers? Yeah, I would say so. Um, I've also done it the other way where I design out how all the data is going to work together and then how I'm going to deliver that to something. And then I build an interface to consume it. And like, I, don't know, I still do projects like that every once in a while, but I find it never goes quite as well as, uh, as it does when, if I start with the user and then work back from that. Backwards. Okay. Um, so it sounds like, you know, almost for full stack research, design, build, test, is actually all together. I mean, I guess you're researching it's is thinking, but it's the, it's, yeah. And then well, what? Oh. Well, one other thing on that. So that happens for a feature. Um, we do all of those things at the same time for one feature, and then you do them again for the next feature. Oh. And so that's not, uh, it's not doing the design and the test and all that kind of stuff 
for the entire app for like a big vision of what this is supposed to be. Um, I go, okay, if I was just trying to like show how many days of toilet paper I got, what, what would be involved with that? Uh, and then you can go like, all right, and now I can order online and now I can do this and now I can do this. All uh -huh. those extra features, um, you go through that entire uh, cycle with all of those things separately. Okay. But the advantage of that is the project is always done. Uh, it's just done with whatever features you have. And then you're adding on, then you're adding on rather than waterfall. That's like, we need 40% of a hundred percent and yes. then we'll go to 50% of the hundred percent. Exactly. Interesting. Okay. I hadn't thought about it that way. And then what's the, so what, how was deployment done in full stack? Do you just like have one switch or like, is it different? Like what, how did you, do, how are you, how did you deploy this to, to real life now that you've got everything working, let's say. Uh, so this one, that one actually isn't deployed, but the, oh yeah, the, the web, oh, app. web app kitchen sink. Yeah, that one's a push button. Um, I, I, I run a command and it goes to the infrastructure that I set up online. But I also have other ones where, because uh, you're always trying to make that simple. Because things that are simple in full stack get done. Things that are complicated get skipped. So, because there's always pressure. You go, oh no, this thing broke. We need to fix it right away. If that's a difficult process, then you won't do it. Uh, and so this goes for things like testing and deployment and you'll cut corners and stuff. And so during like times of peace, you wanna set that stuff up so it's as automated as possible. And like another thing that's really common in full stack deployment is, all right, my code, uh, those tests that I wrote, I have some confidence that this works. So I'm gonna put this on GitHub or wherever I'm keeping the code. And as soon as that happens, it triggers this entire automated process where a computer out in the cloud is also testing the code. And if that computer in the cloud's automated test of the code is a thumbs up, it goes, cool. Now I'm going to, I'm going to deploy this for you. So you don't even have to press a button. It just happens automatically over the course of working on your code. That's called continuous delivery. Mm. And um, that's like, that's the ideal state. Um, and then like, this is where like DevOps engineers, uh, DevOps specialists kind of come in, but you go, okay, well, this is all happening automatically. Um, what can happen then is like, all right, well, we have a huge spike in demand. Well, you want that like expand capacity for all the demand you're getting. You want that to happen automatically. And so a lot of like what really enables full stack stuff to happen is like relying very heavily on automation. Interesting. So, you know, you, you brought up GitHub and I've always found GitHub a little bit ephemeral or something. Like mm -hmm. I thought it was just a place where people were like putting code that they practice. I didn't realize it would actually trigger it to go live into the cloud also for oh, you. Oh yeah. So that, that's part, it's one player in this ecosystem. So what GitHub can do is when they, when you push your code up to GitHub, GitHub uh, has a megaphone and they can go, hey, Kyle just pushed up his code. And then somebody else can be listening for that and they go, Kyle just pushed up his code. And then they grab my code from GitHub and do whatever they want to do with it, like deploy it. Okay, interesting. Yeah. And then do you have a cycle, like have you, gotten feed like now that's live have you gotten students feedback have you done any iterating on on the the web app kitchen sink since it went live you know like uh, that sort of like user feedback and then improvement oh, definitely that's where like the um these like patterns these software patterns those are also ones there's like okay if i have to explain how factory methods work one more time uh you know what why don't i just write an annotated example, and so I can share that out. Mm -hmm. or like so another one, like a living that, well, thing that you, so it's a living thing that you just keep adding to. Exactly. Or like another one that I do that with is uh, this is a site that I built and maintain for Flatiron um, that has like student resources and stuff, and all of that is also driven by like I have this problem. What what can I trick a computer into taking off my back? So this is things like, hey, do you have a video of that one cool talk that you gave? Uh, and then over in this videos uh, area, I have videos of basically everything that I've taught at Flatiron. And I was like, well, I'm having a hard time finding the ones that you did on design. 
okay, so if I search for design, then it narrows down to uh, design stuff. Okay, because you tag your different videos. It, exactly. But like all that was driven by like, I am tired of like <laughs> keeping a spreadsheet of links uh, to mail people. But it's my favorite part about being a full stacker is like, I don't have to wait for somebody else to tell me what to do. Mm. Uh, I'm empowered to solve business problems on my own. Awesome. Yeah. Well, that's a great story. And then a short condensed version. Thank you. This is a nice segue. Um, and I'll open it to any questions. If you have anyone on the, the call has questions, please go ahead and start putting those in the chat box and like all things are welcome. Um, what, what do you wish that recruiters knew more fundamentally about full stack developers when recruiting for them? So when I'm, when I'm interviewing, I get really irritated uh, when a, a recruiter tries to like pigeonhole me or put me in a box and go like, well, are you, I understand full stack. Are you more front end or more back end? And like when I, when I was coming up in software, I didn't know there was supposed to be a difference between those two things. And so to this day, I can't see it. It's all just writing code. They're really, they're not different careers. Um, you write your loops over here and you write your loops over here. Like what computer you write the code on doesn't matter that much. And, uh, but sometimes I'll talk to a recruiter and they're like, they'll really try to figure out if I'm more front end or back end. But I started out as a database engineer and then like, I became a back-end engineer and then a front-end, and I still just go back and forth all over the place. Um, and so, and then it's also the case with technologies. Well, like, I have some technologies that I like and some technologies that I don't want to work with, but I'm not a Vue developer or an Ember developer or an Express developer. I'm a problem solver. And so, like, it doesn't matter that I've never used your stack before. Um, like, I... I can figure it out. They're less different than you maybe think. Uh, and so what, what I'm really interested in is what kind of problems can I work on? I like, I've spent. I just moved it up. No, I'm just oh, coming sorry. back and just wrapping <laughs> up the conversation. No worries. Okay. Sorry to confuse you. <laughs> um, like I, uh, uh, like I've spent pretty much the last 10 years in education uh, and that's ed tech schools, whatever else. I like working on education problems. Um, and so I, that's the part that's important to me, not the tech stack. And that's a really difficult thing I've found to communicate to a lot of uh, recruiters. Well, what would you say, I mean, speaking from the you know, recruiter's perspective, especially when we are sort of newer to technology and we're just like trying to work within like the limited amount of knowledge that we have. And then, you know, we maybe have a, a client or hiring manager that's like pushing us for one way or another and we're just working with what we have. Like, sure. what, what, what advice would you give to recruiters who feel like they need to ask those questions? Like, oh, it's fine. Like the questions are fine. Uh, and if somebody said to me, like, would you be okay working primarily uh, front end for this job? That's a completely reasonable question. What I don't like is, are you a front end developer or a back end developer? Mm. Um, because there, there's an excluded middle there. Right. Um, but yeah, I, I totally might be in a spot where it's like, you know what? I'd love to just rock out, rock out on back end for the next year. So, like, I could be talked into that. But um but yeah like as a as a professional i'm much more than like any narrow part of got it okay got a couple questions coming in um yeah. what would be the one question that you would always want a recruiter to ask you great question oh that's a that's a good one how about uh would you like a million dollars i would always love that question that'd be a great question not bad um <laughs> Question I always want recruiters to ask me. Um, I like, I, I've always appreciated being asked things like, um, what's your ideal team like? Okay. Uh, what, like what, uh, describe like an ideal day of work or something like that. Um, I, I, that's a lot more like engaging to me than like, are you okay with working in a fast paced environment or like <laughs> something like that? Like highly collaborative teams. Right. Um, 
because I do like highly collaborative teams. I'm skeptical of people who are asking for that, especially like phrasing it in that kind of way. That like sets off my spidey sense that like they're trying to trick me into something. Is like, mm. ah, this is like a 70 hour work week kind of place, isn't it? That's why you phrased it that way. Um, but if you ask me like what my ideal like team situation is like, I'll probably describe something that is a lot like highly collaborative and fast paced and a lot of the things that you're looking for. And also like, I want to work in a place where that's cool too. And I, I feel like giving an example, allowing me to give you an example, lets us talk about something concrete together rather than both saying fast paced and meaning very different things. Yeah, I think anytime that we try to like fit in keywords in a question, it's sort of leading, right? Oh, yeah. It's like, whereas if it's more of the open base, tell me about what you, you know, what you're looking for, that invites a lot of more of an open answer. Yes, definitely. <clears throat> All right. Another question is, um, what is one, what is the one of the, the one interesting thing which most full, full stack developers love to do the most with programming? Like what's, what's unique about full stackers as a group, as a persona? Then sure. maybe, you know, front end, back end infrastructure systems people. Mm. Not that, I mean, you know, you're all sure. a little bit unique, of course, but. I think that full stackers probably more than most um, are like experiment with like really new bleeding edgy kinds of things. Um, because a lot of them only work in combination, like in certain contexts or with other things. So if you're in some like siloed part of a technology stack, it might not make sense to play around with something that's um, you know, new or unproven or esoteric. But uh, especially if like you need like to be told what to do essentially. It's like, I need designs and I need an API and I need all these things provided for me. Well, I don't need those things. I can do those things on my own. And so if I want to play with a little technology, I can plug it into all of those things on my own. Mm. Um, and so like a uh, good example, there's a technology called Phoenix that I'm kind of interested in right now. Uh, it's for back end, but like I can take some existing front end that I have and uh, I could even take a, an existing backend that I have and kind of convert that over to Phoenix and see if it still works with my front end, see if it works faster, see if it's a more pleasant experience. But I feel like it's, um, I, can, I can play with those things sort of across the stack in a way that would be difficult if I required a lot of collaborators, coll collaborators to play with something that I don't even know is going to be worth it. And like, so if I would need three other people to really get a sense of whether or not this is any cool, to, a good idea to work with, I have to, that's a higher barrier to entry for mm -hmm. me um, than like I currently have, so. Kind of sounds like full stack folks tend to be kind of independent and they want to, a little bit insatiable or something that they want to yeah. be involved in everything. I would say that's like not inaccurate. <laughs> <laughs> so wait, what is, what is Phoenix? Is it a language? Is it a framework? What is it? A framework. Um, it's a it the, la the language is Elixir. The framework is Phoenix. This would be, um, so uh, I, I currently teach Rails a lot. And um, there are things that I really like about Rails, but there's also things that I super duper don't. And Phoenix is, a, a, kind of bridges that gap a little bit, or at least claims to. And so, and like a lot of developers that I respect have been playing around with it and talk about it on Twitter and stuff. And so I go, Hmm, maybe one of these weekends I'll give that a shot. Okay. So it's a kind of, is it more of the back, the back end yeah. code? Okay. Awesome. Um, let's see one more question. I think, you know, that'd be interesting. Well, I'll have maybe a couple more when I'm thinking of like, you know, the persona approach with developers, mm -hmm. what, what's the typical frustration for you in your workplace as a full stack developer? Um, like what's something that like in your last job with people, sure. like what, what, no, you don't have to like call it out specifically, but in general, like things that irritate me in a workplace sure. as a full stack developer are. Um, probably number one is like being told what I, how I have to solve a problem. And mm -hmm. so I think this kind of goes along with the like, oh, you're a full stack developer, but that just means front end uh, with like an asterisk on it or something. And so you, you have to use this back end tool because that's what the company approved. Like stuff like that drives me crazy. Um, what I, I, 
Hang on, my kid is screaming. Oh, they're just making dumb sounds. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I, I uh, one of the things I'll say to managers a lot is like, rephrase that as a question, please. <laughs> oh, there you go. Uh, rephrase that as a problem. Um, right. You know, like, uh, you have to use rails. I was like, uh, 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 rephrase as a problem. That might be, we currently have this big investment in rails. We need something that will integrate with these technologies and the performance needs to be X. Cool. Maybe rails is the right choice for that. But when you rephrase it as a problem, that gets my problem solver working. That's a bit more exciting. Like, exactly. It's like, all right, well, maybe that's the right choice, or maybe I can solve this problem even better given those constraints with mm. this. But as soon as like somebody tries to tell me what to do, my like anti-authoritarian streak, uh, like my gets my hackles up. Yeah. And uh, I start finding reasons why that's an unreasonable thing to ask me. Um, but I like solving problems. So like you can do the exact same thing, rephrase as a problem and that'll get me engaged. more engagement. Another last, I have another follow up question. And yeah. if anyone else has any more questions, feel free to throw those in the chat. But, um, you know, now with the, no, the, the advent of Node, so for folks yeah. that are kind of newer to the space, Node.js is, it's a JavaScript framework that allows you to work in the back end as a front end in JavaScript. So JavaScript is a front end language. So you, we now have full stack developers that are genuinely only in JavaScript, which yeah. is technically, so a full right. stack front end engineer is a thing. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that compared to a full stack multi-tool like yourself? Uh, any, any, can you just speak to that a little bit? Totally fine. Um, like, and I think this is a thing that non-technical people way overestimate is how different languages and frameworks are. Um, I love Node. I use it all the time. It's like my go-to for backend stuff. Um, but I also like was a technical lead for a team that had a PHP backend for a year. Um, and in my current job where I, te I teach Rails, they didn't even ask if I knew Rails before I started there. Like they assumed I'd figure it out and I did because I'm a programmer, it's what we do. Right. Um, and so if somebody's uh, like, pretty much exclusive experience is in JavaScript. Like having exposure to more languages helps. It helps you, it, it, uh, it's one of those things where like every language that you learn makes you better at all the ones that you already know, just like natural language. But um, no, I don't think that like means anything significant. Mm -hmm. I think it opened the door for a lot of people that considered themselves just front end. Like, oh, I don't have to pick up a new language and I can be back end now also. Um, but if you took those exact same people and you're like, oh, here's a Java backend, like they, they wouldn't be like, oh, I don't understand what any of these funny words mean. That's not that different. Well, and you bring, yeah, you bring up a good point that I hear often from our, in the development community is like, I am, they're just tools. Like, yeah. I, you know, just like you learn one thing, you can learn another. And so that's something right. that it's really important for us as recruiters to recognize, especially when we're guiding and sort of leading our hiring teams. Like just sort of like you're, it's not just, don't just state what you need. Like what, what are you trying to solve? Uh, because the tools can be transferable. Um, oh, totally. No, like it's a, I'm, I'm a carpenter. Like I know that I use a hammer, I, I may have never used a mallet before, but I kind of get the idea. This is a right. thing you swing it. Yeah. You know, like you have a screwdriver is like, oh, I know that you've used a drill bit before, but you haven't used a spade before. I'm looking for somebody who has experience with using spades. Right. So, You're like, no, I can, I, I dig in all types of dirt. With yeah, <laughs> exactly. No problem. <laughs> all right. We've got two more questions in and then we'll wrap it up. Um, this is a great one. This is about outreach messages. So this is a very good one uh, mm -hmm. coming in. Half the time, I mean, more than half the time, top talent are not up, out there applying to our jobs. And in oh. technical recruiting, we have to go out hunting and we have to like entice people. And yeah. there's some pretty embarrassing messages that go out by recruiters. But, yes. uh, you know, what in your experience, what would you say is sort of, what are some of the best outreach messages you've received or what, what would mm -hmm. need to be comprised within those messages for you to get back to them? Like sure. talking about what the thing is or the problem or the industry, 
tips there for getting outreach messages that are effective? Sure. So some of it like is a numbers game. Uh, if I'm very happy at my job right now, I, I didn't even read your message. Um, uh, I just cleared it the second it came in. But if I'm, uh, uh, I didn't come up with this term, but I love it, shields down, uh, which is like, I'm at my job, but I could be talked out of it. Right. <laughs> um, that's when I start reading recruiter messages. And there's like no way that you could know otherwise. Uh, so, right. so sometimes you don't hear anything back and like, that's why. But let's say I'm shields down uh, and I'm looking at my recruiter messages. Um, I will, there's two things that'll get me to read it. One is if I already just am interested in your company uh, and I, I, I've already like kind of been interested in working there. If a recruiter reaches out, I go, oh, cool. I don't care what the content of your message is. Like that, that's like enough of a nudge that was like, all right, cool, let's talk. Um, so assuming that like that's not the case though, the only other thing that'll get me to read that message is if you indicate that you have read my LinkedIn profile or my resume or done any amount of research on like me specifically, if I smell a generic recruiter message, I, I'm just, I'm not gonna read it. Um, but I, and also like this used to work and I think it doesn't like in April, 2020, uh, is this like, oh, I see you've been at your current job for a year. Uh, are you interested in exploring something else? That used to be enough. Uh, they'd be like, oh, you care about me. But like, it's got to be a little bit more than that now. So like, I got one the other day that was great. That was like, um, wow, you are a really interesting combination of uh, like developer and business person and you have this deep background in education that actually works out really well for our company because we actually have need of kind of all of those things and uh like that i think that one in particular might have been like we need someone uh, like a player coach who can manage a team but also we need a lot of training done um and so and you're also going to need to be really hands-on with the stuff so i can actually see a really good connection there that is like that's amazing magical yes um, like I, you feel seen <laughs> exactly and, and um, it's all the things that you like like yes. yeah seriously yeah and so i want like <laughs> i want a recruiting message that shows that like i don't know you're you're making a pitch so like pitch me right um but yeah if it if it just feels like a spam message then like i, I also i know that some devs get like upset by that i don't um i don't get hurt feelings about getting a spam message from a recruiter. I don't hate recruiters. Uh, I love recruiters. Like, I don't understand why somebody would get mad at somebody who's trying to help you get a job. Right. But, but yeah, I probably won't look at the message if, it, if it's not to me. Right, that makes sense. All right, last question. It's kind of around um, uh, technical interviews mm -hmm. and the interviewing process. Um, yeah. What's you know, when you're going through an interview process, what are your thoughts on like completing technical assignments? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of conversation. I mean, most developers are working and they're not yeah. interested in doing a six hour project just to see if they get a foot in the door. Sure. But at the same time, that's kind of like old school and companies are like holding on to that. What are, what are your opinions on the technical skill assessment prior to on sites or during the on site or sure. in general? Um. I personally don't mind them that much. Uh, I'm probably on the more permissive side of that though. I think most, most of my peers uh, bristle pretty hard at most coding challenges. Um, and I think like one of the reasons I'm a little bit softer on that is like, I've been on both sides of it. I totally get why you would text screen someone. And like, uh, there's like maybe the most disastrous thing you can do for your business is like let the wrong person in. And so, I think some due, some due diligence is warranted. That said, um, in addition to like, uh, I'm a very busy, important person, and how dare you try to take up six hours of my time? Uh, I think there's also like a very real and worthwhile conversation happening in dev right now. Like, how fair are those? Because like they assume they assume like a pretty high level of privilege. Um, and right. Like, like Whatever. I've got all this extra time I'm taking yeah, exactly. care of my kids. I've got, yeah. Right. And so it ends up like reinforcing a lot of like kind of negative things. So the things that I've seen that 
um, address that while also like minimally pissing off developers are things that like um, give you give you some options. So like you could because like I love take home challenges. I think and I think that they're really like friendly to a lot of developers that just clam up during like in-person whiteboarding interviews. Mm. It's terrifying. By the way, they're terrifying. They're like not fun at all. Um, I really, I really would like all whiteboarding part of interviews to just be thrown out the window. Oh, totally. It's just who performs well being stared at. No like, kidding. But uh, if I, but I also know people who are like, oh, the take home, how much time are you expecting me to spend on this? If you give me some options between those, it's like, tell you what, you can do this take home challenge, you can do it at your leisure. Um, also, uh, you can do a whiteboarding challenge. If you want to like just show up for an hour sometime and like do this kind of thing, that's fine also. Another one that I think uh, is relatively friendly to developers um, is like, cool, what I want you to do is take some project that you already made and uh, walk me through it. Um, uh, defend some decisions, uh, like um, talk about why you picked this over another thing, uh, talk about what was hard of working on this, what would you change if like you were still working on this project. Um, that feels like a fairly like low barrier to, to entry to me. But I think overall, developers get irritated by those challenges if they feel like I put six hours into this, you put zero hours into this, and like you just brushed me off and said, you know, we're looking for someone with more experience. Uh, also, that particular phrase, I'd like that one to like come out of a lot of vocabularies. <laughs> um, right, well. Because uh, it's yeah. almost never true, it just means no. Um, but like, I think there's a lot, especially newer people, and especially underrepresented people hear that and think it's true. And then you end up hiring somebody with like half as much experience as the person you said that to. Well, well, the, whole, the whole concept, like you, and I appreciate you've said this to me in, over the years, is like, years experience is somewhat irrelevant in technology oh, yeah. because oh, yeah. it's all about aptitude, it's about ability, it's about drive. And like you said, you might have one developer on your team for seven years who had the same first year seven times. And then yes. you've got, you know, the young up and coming person who's really ambitious, who in two and a half years knows as much as that person in their seven years. And so oh, absolutely. how do we guide our teams to get away from years experience and into mm -hmm. you have the ability to do X with these yep. tools, you've done that with this, not yep. three years in Java, because three years in Java, what does that even mean? It's like yeah, getting away from quantity Java. and more from outcomes and like ability. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so like, uh, I think a way that you can phrase the postings and stuff that will also, are also a little bit less hostile to people who will like automatically discount themselves if they don't hit every checkbox is you describe the things that will be done on the job not the history that you hope that a candidate has it's like so on the job you'll be doing this 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 and this if you're comfortable with that we invite you to apply mm. um, because it doesn't make any assumptions about whether or not you've done those things before right. i think a lot of people go like we're looking for somebody with three to five years of Rails, Rails experience. And they go, well, I did a tutorial once, but, uh, or I did a year, but uh, it's, not, it's not even close. And so they'll discount themselves. First they go like, you'll be working with Rails every day. Are you cool with that? And I'm like, yeah, it's not, not a problem. Well, speaking of that, bringing that back around is also like when you think about the, the barrier of entry in mm -hmm. development, and that there are people that are underrepresented that have never been given a chance in the first yeah. place. Like, how are they supposed to get three years experience when no one will give them a freaking job? Right. You know what I mean? So like, I, yeah, I, as, as a, to build a bigger tent, we have to get away from years of experience by recognizing that until someone gets an opportunity, they're not even going to get the experience. And like, how convenient you're just like locking out this group that you don't really want to like, do something different to get something new and the you know like same totally. input same output and we got to change the input uh, absolutely and like when i started in this business like I, I went in the easy way the easy way is you write really bad code and then after a while it's not so bad anymore you want to talk about somebody who like did this the hard way a code school grad they like quit their lives for three to six months and like immerse themselves in this and just got like you know, tasked for for half a year 
all while they weren't like making any money and like were away from their families and like that's the hard way into this and so there's a lot of people who started in this like me who not only did the first year seven times maybe worked in some butt in a seat job uh which is very little demanded of them and but they go oh they have seven years of java experience you have somebody who like went through the gauntlet and was like this into this they were willing to quit their lives you go oh well you have four months of school and no professional experience like there's more packed into that than you might otherwise assume and it's also so much more intense and relevant than like the same thing in computer science like yeah, computer science you might even not learn how to code i mean yeah, it's, it's, just... it's not a part of computer science program yeah the whole requirement of a cs degree is also sort of like cutting out a, a huge, it's almost like approaching 20 to 30% of the, the development yes. market now. And yeah, I mean, that's a whole nother conversation on how do we build a bigger tent in, in development. And um, yeah, and then the road, left, the road traveled, right? You would yes. want someone that surmounted some real challenges and prioritized yes. this industry rather than like, ah, it was easy and I kind of fell into it. Yeah, you know? exactly. <laughs> Awesome. Well, this has been such a pleasure as always, Kyle. I well, like seeing awesome. you. Good to see you. Um, thanks to everyone on the call. Thanks for the questions. These are great questions. Um, I'll make a note for our next developer convos to have these lined up too. Um, we will put this on our the Recruiting Innovation YouTube. I'll put it in the Tech Interview Transformation um, Facebook group. Y'all are wonderful. Thank you, Kyle, for your time as always. And uh, I hope everyone has a great day um, and we'll all see you, see you again soon. I'm, again, I'm Allison Daly, uh, founder of Recruiting Innovation and uh, keep up the learning. Thanks everybody. Doot doot. Bye.